This is The Rob Black Show. The Rob Black Show is on social media, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Search The Rob Black Show. And now, Rob Black. Welcome in, Rob Black. Good money on Pop. I think Monday is a pretty technical data, but by Friday, I'm pretty strategy theory. And in between, you get better stories, but a lot of technicals on Monday. The stories are never that great. Coming off a strong week of gains. I say that today. A week ago, it's like coming off a week of, of weakness. My, how five days changes everything. Stock market looks poised to begin today. Kind of a little on the curious side. By that, will we extend record closes? Will we go sideways? Will we wait for the Federal Reserve to cause a recession? We'll talk about that and much, much more as the show goes on. But the S&P market was fairly positive this morning. The markets all opened near the green or in the green, but the Dow has pulled back four tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 is down fractions. The Nasdaq's up one half of one percent. Not a lot of direction there, right? Nasdaq's being led by tech stocks. Take away the tech stocks and it's kind of a negative day. Nike is still raking in billions from Michael Jordan's brand. We'll talk about that maybe as the episode goes on because that's kind of a story. But over the weekend, President Biden clarified that he did not mean to create an impression that he would veto the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure deal. He agreed to if the larger budget reconciliation package did not get agreed to as well. Ultimately, that's made everyone happy. There's some more immediate growth. Oh, made everyone happy. Republicans and Democrats expect an infrastructure deal to get done now. $1.2 trillion is the expectation. A lot of infrastructure stocks like John Deere and Caterpillar will be winners. There's more growth concerns related to the spreading Delta variant. I'm not a scientist, but the best I could scrape up for you this weekend was out of about 100 cases in the UK of the Delta variant that people have died from, about 50% of them have been vaccinated. So there is an issue to continue to wear your mask or not. And I can tell you from just looking around this weekend, people are like, not. That probably doesn't bode well. We will probably see some sort of resurgence if what goes on in Europe and the UK comes in the United States. It's kind of been the pattern so far. And again, I'm doing the best I can, not as a data scientist, to try to mill through some of this for you. Anxiousness is built. Oh, and by the way, I get shamed now for wearing a, a, a mask. And that's unacceptable. Um, I got shamed in front of my child, and that's doubly unacceptable. Some a-hole was like, oh, it must be Halloween. He's wearing a mask. Oh, and I just think, high school failed you. That is not appropriate behavior, okay? Boeing is drawing some added attention this morning after the company's 777 aircraft is unlikely to win certification approval until the middle or latter part of 2023. This is a big honking plane. And I think Boeing has kind of earned the right for slower certification after their 737 MAX botched it and was involved in some plane crashes that probably didn't need to happen if the world was a little bit slower to certify. But because their track record was so perfect, we kind of rubber stamped it. And again, that's just my read on it, and I don't know if I'm right. So CEO of Boeing's confident that it's going to be certified, but it's a long process. Of note, United Airlines is getting very close to submitting a large order for 200 of Boeing 737 MAX aircraft really putting that issue behind Boeing and the airline industry. Further of note, I think this is a fascinating one this morning because it's one of the headlines that shocked me. United Airlines 
is profitable as of July. I think we were all thinking it was going to be a little bit longer. But talking about reopening, we reopened. And I don't think there is any looking back in that kind of scenario. Johnson & Johnson agreed to pay $230 million, maybe as much as $260 million to New York over nine years to settle litigation related to its role in feeding the opioid epidemic. Here's something that's sad. I know very little about the opioid epidemic. My world of money doesn't really cross in that area very often, other than when there's lawsuits against companies like Johnson & Johnson. Now, here's where it's going to piss you off what I'm about to say next. I know you're saying, careful, Rob, don't get canceled. I bet if we take a look at Johnson & Johnson's share price, that it's probably not collapsing. And I know that the opioid crisis has killed many, many young people with overdoses. Stock's up 56 cents today, up three, one third of 1%. Now you're saying, well, maybe it was already priced into it. No, not really. Stock has gone from 140 a year ago to 164 while paying a 2.6% dividend. So maybe you're like, okay, maybe the opioid crisis is five years old. No, not really. It's gone from 110 up to 164. Not the best return, but also paying a 2.6% dividend yield each year every year during that period of time. It's been a performer, a slight market underperformer. But you hear about a company like Johnson Johnson go to court and you're like, I bet they're going to get punished. I bet their stock is going to get walloped. Not so much. Let's take a look at some market numbers for the year. The Nasdaq's up 11.4%. The S&P 500 is up 14%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 12.5%. Bitcoin up 18.8%. It's been a very good year for those four areas. Now, Ethereum, Bitcoin's ugly little sister, is up 166%. Not so ugly, huh? The bipartisan infrastructure deal's back on track. Senate appears to have the 60 votes needed to pass the infrastructure deal. 70% of millennials are living paycheck to paycheck. That has huge ramifications when a health care cost comes out of nowhere on you. More Americans are turning to thrift stores. Etsy may be a play on that. Other stories of note, we are kicking off the summer at record highs with very little volatility. Nike, a company that should be pretty well established in your mind, jumped 15% on a positive earnings release on Friday. Michael Jordan hasn't played a game in more than 18 years, but Nike is still raking in billions from his brand, which is what we learned from the conference call. The CEO casually mentioned on the conference call on Friday that Jordan brand sales rose an impressive 31% to $5 billion. The Jordan brand makes up about 11% of Nike's overall business. Somehow, Michael Jordan became one of the richest endorsees of all time, but Somehow I think Nike actually won as well, right? You can find me online at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Questions about how to invest in your retirement? Check out The Rob Black Show online, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Subscribe to the podcast and video channels, robblackshow.com. So... I did a run to the dump this weekend, a little spring cleaning. And what was fascinating to me again is if you've never been to the dump, it's pretty educational and they make elementary school kids go to the dump and they get talked to by waste management services. Believe it or not, you can actually invest in a trash company and one man's trash is another man's investment. And they don't come and take that stuff for free from your home. And they don't recycle it for free, and they don't deal with the city for free. I I throw that out there because you could really invest in anything. 
and I almost want you to think about something as boring as waste management. Ticker symbol is WM. In no way, shape, or form am I saying buy this. I'm saying look at it. One man's trash is your treasure, potentially as an investment. In the last five years, it's gone from $63 to $140 a share, more than up 100%. Now, there was strangely a time where it did collapse during the 2020 bear market. It collapsed from 120 all the way down to 92. But again, five years ago, it started off at 63. And now it's at 139. To me, it looks a little bit expensive, but it's also incredibly boring. Guess what I'm going to produce tomorrow? Trash. Day after that, trash. Now, there was an episode of The Twilight Zone where there was an inventor who came up with a device that we could put trash into, and it suddenly disappeared forever. And it changed the world for the better. It was a clean, beautiful world. But what really was happening, we were sending that trash to another planet. And the last scene of the episode on The Twilight Zone was this planet dying from the toxicity of our trash. And all the aliens were dying, and the fish were dying, and we had killed a whole other planet with our trash. So this weekend, I go to the dump. To the dump, to the dump, to the dump, dump, dump. Where did the Lone Ranger take his trash? To the dump, to the dump, to the dump, dump, dump. Uh, uh. So it, it's a little bit sad when you go because you're like, oh, you go, that's a pretty good looking pot. And like, you, I could go plant a plant in it. And why is someone throwing that away? You're like, if you put it in front of your house, Rob Black would have taken it. The amount of stuff I put in front of my house is unreasonable. Second market in the United States is big business. As the underwear gnomes once said in South Park, big business. By 2025, the second-hand market is going to grow from $36 billion to $77 billion. Resale is the major driver. So Macklemore's song, Thrift Shop, should be going through your head right now. And boy, is that a fun song to get ready to go out to have a couple drinks on a Friday. But I'm not 25 years old anymore, so... I don't do it, but I would if I could. So resale is expected to make up 61% of secondhand markets. It's grown 11 times faster than the overall apparel industry. A friend of mine on Facebook posted that her and her 20-year-old daughter in New York went thrift shopping. You can find some great stuff. I mentioned at one point in time that I buy my kids ski jackets at their shop shops. Now you can do it in the city itself, like Vale. You can do it in the city, Breckenridge. They have thrift shops where people give up their winter gear. Good stuff. Or you can do it in a Palo Alto where it's way cheaper because in the winter cities, the Lake Tahoe's, the Breckenridge's, the Vales, the thrift shops know that it, they can get a hundred dollars for that. They know that you showed up ski, to ski without a jacket and you went to the store and it was $400. So the thrift stores make money. But if you do it at home during spring after the mom said, you know what, we didn't go ski enough this year. There's a bit of a drought. I'm going to put this, I'm going to just take it to the thrift store. Take it to Goodwill. I have no shame in that. My personal love is when I see a good looking woman driving a car. That's used. I don't like new cars. I don't even like new clothes, all things considered. Are they attractive? Yes. Should people be throwing money down the tube for things that they're going to throw away in a year or two years? There's a thing called H&M, which is incredibly fast fashion, but after about three washes, you've destroyed it. Fast fashion means it's the right color. It's the right fit. It's the right look. It's straight from New York or Paris. But the problem with H&M clothes is they're cheap. It's almost as if they have uh, dissolvable threads in them. So the thrift store market is grown 11 times faster than the overall apparel market. That blows my mind. When you see that kind of growth, you love it. I like growth stocks because growth stocks are basically outperforming the GDP of the United States. 
I like that outperformance. It gives me room to grow. There's one company that I know that does secondhand and it does it really well. And it's Etsy. Now, I've never looked at the stock from a financial statements level, but I'm going to look at it later today, maybe tomorrow. I've got a busy day. I'm going to be interviewing Chief of Portfolio Strategy from EP Wealth, Adam Phillips. I'll be posting that onto my YouTube channel tomorrow. We're going way off script today. So it'll be interesting to see how he thinks on his feet. Something tells me he'll be fine. But Etsy has agreed to acquire Generation Z favorite Depop, D-E-P-O-P. It's got 30 million users in 150 countries. Etsy's spending $1.6 plus billion. Rent Runway is saying, you know what? We're going to start selling used goods. Chad Burton, he's a dork at times. He said something once. He goes, yeah, I buy all my uh, winter trucks because he, he hauls skis and snowboards and stuff like that. He goes, I buy all my uh, big winter trucks used. It's new to me. So, and he typically gets like a pretty good big engine vehicle that's two or three years old. So he's not paying that premium of the new. I'm not saying you want to rent underwear. I'm not saying you want to buy secondhand underwear. No, I'm not. I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm thinking about it, but I'm not doing it. But the younger generation, Generation Z and the millennials, they're good with apparel, shoes and accessories bought secondhand. And it's a thing to go thrift shopping. I know it's always been a thing, but no, no, it's growing 11 times faster than going to stores. 33 million people shopped secondhand for the first time in 2020. Across the board, 42% of consumers plan to devote more money to secondhand in the next five years. It's a big category shift. I'm looking at Etsy. What you see is what you get with me. I'm Rob Black. The Rob Black Show is on social media, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Search The Rob Black Show. At one point in my life, I had about $4 million of life insurance that I had until age 60. It's term life insurance, and I technically still have it. It doesn't feel as important to me because I've achieved all the financial milestones that I want it to, which basically means if I kick over debt at 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, my family would be, they would have enough without the life insurance. But I had life insurance before I was financially set in case I got into a unfortunate scenario. Knowing me, it would be something like, I don't know, maybe a python. that's never been seen before in California. It suddenly shows up in, in California and I happen to step on it. Maybe it would be me going skydiving and the chute not opening. I assure you I plan to die in a kind of humorous way. When I got married for the first time that morning, I asked my friend to take me swimming with sharks because if it just wasn't meant to be, it just wasn't meant to be. So I got to swim with sharks and I lived. So I was like, dang, now I got to get married. And that marriage lasted under a year telling you that probably wasn't meant to be. And maybe this shark should have eaten me, ate me, chowed on me, slurped me up. But I had life insurance in case a worst case scenario hits. And I still have it. But I think you should have life insurance in case a worst case scenario hits. You, you just got to look at headlines. Three weeks ago, it was a car barreling into a group of bicyclers on a weekend taking out six into critical condition and killing one. I don't know which one I'd rather be. Critical condition where I may be in a wheelchair and my children may have to like, you know, feed me and wipe me and do things that I don't want my children doing. Or would I rather die? I, I was prepared for both with disability insurance and with term life insurance. 
Last weekend, a building collapses. Buildings don't collapse in the United States. A building collapsed in the United States. Consider some disability insurance and some term life insurance. You don't need whole life insurance. You don't need variable life insurance. And I'm sorry for every life insurance agent out there who sells whole life insurance and variable life insurance. I think your job sucks. I think you should get a different job. People like me, we buy term life and we invest the rest. And then when we're 52, we go, you know what? Because I've been investing, I don't need this term life anymore. If I die, my family has over $4 million. I still have it because it's cheap. And to me, then I would be like winning a lottery, but that's, that's not the point. It's not supposed to win the lottery. It's supposed to replace my income. So consider that. That's my sober segment of the moment. Let's stay even more sober. 70% of millennials are living paycheck to paycheck. That's more than any other generation. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, it probably means you're running out of money for either vacations, for saving, or for emergencies. Millennials are a precarious life stage, hitting expensive life milestones, but not yet hitting peak earnings. 70% of the generation said they're living paycheck to paycheck. 54% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, but millennials have the biggest um, kind of broken karma, broken energy. In, in large part, because you're younger and that's when you should be saving. That's when you, that's when it, it pays off to save. 40% of baby boomers and seniors said they live paycheck to paycheck. That's the least of any generation. Living paycheck to paycheck to me reflects economic needs and wants. Just as much, if not more, than incomes or wealth levels. It's a little bit more complicated than saying you're not saving money. You're not getting by. You're edging by. And that could put you in a precarious situation if you get disabled or you lose your job. For no other reason than say like your CEO has an affair with a secretary and the company goes down. And suddenly because you're paycheck to paycheck and that paycheck dries up, uh-oh. You're like, I didn't even do anything. It was my stupid CEO. I know, right? That would get the best of me in my mind, and I don't like that. And then if you're living paycheck to paycheck, something I really, really don't like is medical debt. Number one cause of Americans struggling financially is medical debt. The cost of health care in the United States has grown worse in recent years. As Americans continue to take on unprecedented levels of medical debt. The issue has gotten so bad that people are using donations to buy up people's medical debts. Um, that just seems odd. There's a company called RIP Medical Health. They announced the purchase of $278 million in medical debt owed by roughly 82,000 patients in Tennessee and Virginia. Medical debt's the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. Does that sound like we're a, an America that we should be proud of? Or is that kind of like, that's one of our ugly things that we hide, the sins of our fathers? Speaking of affairs, right? So I once went to a concert and one of the band members got preachy. You know, when they tell you how they do things that are great. They say things like, we got to save this planet, and yet they flew to the destination on a, on a plane. One of the biggest sources of pollution on the planet, planes. Um, but then they get a little preachy, and they're like, yeah, today, you know, if you – half our proceeds from T-shirts are going to go to retiring medical debt. And it, it was the first time I ever heard that. And I'm in this industry that I didn't know there was charities designed to retire other people's medical debt. Now – the healthcare system, it's, it's, it's easy to be critical of. It's an easy target. Now, keep in mind, if I go in for a breast augmentation, I know you're saying, what, Rob? What are you talking about? If I go in for a nose job and I die on the table, people aren't supposed to die on the table for nose jobs. 
there's gonna be lawsuits. And that's one of the reasons medical healthcare takes as costs as much as it does. It is a broken system all the way around. Roughly 21 million Americans holding 46 billion of medical debt face collections, meaning that a third party debt collector is trying to obtain the money owed. That sucks. I had a debt collector right out of college because I got into some credit card debt in college, which I didn't have a full time job. And why did the credit card industry give a, a kid who drank beer and ate pizza a credit card? I think it's stupid that we let credit cards into the college campuses. I don't think it's stupid that an 18 year old has a credit card. I think it's stupid that we let credit card companies onto a campus and not into their home where mom and dad could possibly say, what are you signing? Because let's put it this way. You're not exactly thinking about it. And your dormitory roommate, Skippy, might go, yeah, yeah, get it, get it. We'll get some pizza. You just declare bankruptcy later. I had a friend. I know I dated a girl who's a friend. So I knew her. We double dated a couple times or you know, we hung out together. Her whole thing was get credit cards, run up clothes, declare bankruptcy, and repeat the cycle in three years. Like, what? That's a thing? Yes. Credit card companies are more than willing to give a credit card to someone who's got bad credit, knowing that they can charge more. And maybe mommy and daddy bail them out the second time. So the United States spends significantly more money per capita on healthcare, $10,586. While Germany, the Netherlands, and Australia trail far behind. We have a healthcare system that has financing written into it. And uh, having debt collectors is just a horrible thing. You don't feel good. They call you and they're like, can I speak to Mr. Robert Black? And you're like, uh, he's not here right now. Okay, give him a message kind of thing. And then, you, and then you're like, yeah, he's dead. You get tired of taking the message. And you're like, yeah, he died. And they don't believe you. It stinks to be high in the eight ball. But we spend so much on health care. U.S. spends significantly more per capita per year on health care, $10,586. Do you think you're spending that kind of money? Or is it your insurance? Or is it like how much is your uh, deductible? How much is your monthly installment that you do through your job? It's a lot of money. Americans pay the price. Quality health care is unaffordable for about 46 million Americans. An emergency room visit, you have to think twice about. You know my puppy, 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 0110101. She is prone to getting into situations where it's an emergency room and it's an emergency room on a Saturday. Why on a Saturday? Why an emergency room? Yeah, there's no good insurance for that. Childbirth and related care, 22%. Dental care, 20%. Leading causes of medical debt. Um, we don't really have a great system there. And I, I, I'd say something smart like, don't forget to get medical insurance. But I, I think that's a goes without saying getting medical insurance is a lot of money and if we're living paycheck to paycheck we're setting ourselves up for medical disasters you can find me online at Rob Black Show I'm Rob Black questions about how to invest in your retirement check out the Rob Black Show online YouTube Facebook and Twitter subscribe to the podcast and video channels robblackshow.com so Here's inflation and why inflation is the boogeyman. I work in television, and because of that, I have to look reasonably attractive. I know you're saying, no, 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 no. The station you work at is notorious for having the ugliest looking anchors. Uh, that's not true, but there's some truth in it that the 21st century, we're going less Barbie world and less Ken and being much more realistic, but I care about my appearance. During COVID-19, I kind of locked myself away. 
in a cabin in the mountains trying to protect myself. I always feel that if there was a horror movie, I'm the first guy to die. I'd be the guy who's like the contractor who's come to fix your attic. And I go up in the attic. I'm like, what's that noise? And that's when the monster jumps out and eats my head off. I feel like if I'm in the post-apocalyptic world with Mad Max and I'm going to be the guy who gets the arrow in the chest while we're all talking strategy of how we're going to take down the bad guys. I'm going to be the mayor of Trash Town that is the sacrificial lamb for the bad guys. So I was a little bit of a cautious and I, I, I kind of started doing some of my own haircutting. So I kind of gave up on my haircut person and I went to book an appointment with her because I'm getting ready for some photos and getting ready for a little more live in studio and stuff like that. And she goes, uh, I raised my prices and I don't do men's haircuts anymore. I'm like, how much are you charging just out of curiosity? She won't do anything for under $120 now. And she was doing my hair for like 40, 45, which it wasn't really worth it because I don't have that much hair. And it, it's not really that complicated, but she did like a million little cuts. And I kind of, I find it kind of sexy and enjoyable to sit in a chair and have my head cut and massage. And I find haircuts very relaxing. I typically fall asleep during haircuts. That's how relaxing I find them. But to go from 40 bucks to 120, I was like, uh-uh. Maybe I'll keep cutting my own hair. Because really, there's really not that much left of it. But by the time I'm 60, I'll, I'll have probably 50% chrome. The old chrome dome. And by the time I'm 65, it'll probably all be gone. And I'm okay with that, but I'm not, you shouldn't pay $120 to have that trimmed up, right? It's kind of like a very slow growing bush in the front yard. You don't got to maintain it that much. But that's inflation, and that's, that's the negative of inflation. So she's priced me out of the market. Now she can get that money from elsewhere, so she's fine. There's more than enough people willing to pay her that. Otherwise, she'll only be charging those prices. So good for her, bad for me. Muhammad L. Aryan. He, I'm going to make fun of someone in 10 seconds. Be ready for it. He's one of those people that works in the industry, and he's kind of a bond specialist. And sadly, he has a lisp. And sadly, I don't mind people having lisps. And I'm not making fun of people with a lisp. But if you have a lisp, don't talk about the New York Jets winning the Super Bowl. Because that just sounds funny with the New York Jets winning the Super Bowl. And then you throw a lisp on top of it and you just can't be taken seriously. So he gets on CNBC and he talks about the Jets. And I'm always like, no, 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 no. Talk about inflation. That's what you're good at. And I mostly agree with everything he says on inflation. He used to be a partner at PIMCO with a guy named Bill Gross. Now, I never really liked Bill Gross. I'm not saying Bill Gross was gross, but he did kind of have that porn mustache thing going. We were like, that's a little inappropriate, like too much nose hair for a guy who's balding on top. Like you're, there's a bad overcompensation there. Didn't like it. So I never really liked Bill Gross. And he's like a hot yoga guy. If there's one thing I hate, it's men doing hot yoga. I know you're saying, is this your sexist segment of the show? Apparently, yes. Why do I hate men doing hot yoga? Because I don't want to do hot yoga and I'm a man. There, There's my rationale. But El Arian was talking today, Muhammad El Arian. And he's saying the Fed needs to be careful. They're behind on inflation and they risk another recession if they're forced to catch up. But they also could cause a recession if they go too fast. Now, he didn't say that. I said that. But let's quote him for a little bit. He was the expert on CBC Today. He says, I have concerns about the inflation story. Every day I see evidence of inflation not being transitory. And I have concern that the Fed is falling behind and that if I, it may have to play catch up. And history makes you feel very uncomfortable if you end up in a world where the Fed raises rates too quickly. He's right. I don't see it really as transitory when you see wage inflation. It's very tough to tell a kid, hey, come work at McDonald's and flip burgers. And we're going to pay you $18 an hour. Oh, but next year we're going to pay you $14 an hour. I think the bar is being lifted on wages. And it, it's, it's almost humorous 
that we go through protests where fast food workers march in the streets of livable wage march protests. Nothing happens. Maybe one state, one city goes along with it. San Francisco says all waiters and waitresses get health care and it's going to be a surcharge on your bill. That was a thing people were very upset with on both sides. So to me, inflation, I don't think it's transitory. I, yeah, the food cost and the gasoline could be. Food could be having problems due to the pandemic where we had to shut down processing plants due to COVID getting on the line. But it feels like the food could be also due to the drought, which doesn't seem to be getting any better. 116 degrees this weekend in Portland, a city known as kind of chilly and rainy. Suddenly it's scorching and, and dry. So I kind of agree with El Arion that we have to be paying attention to inflation now. Don't really like it, but I'm with him. And I think the Fed will either cause a recession being too slow or cause a recession being too fast. There's no Goldilocks in this scenario. Wall Street anticipates, in my opinion, NASDAQ rises to a record high as tech stocks climb, Dow falls 100. A little bit of love for the growth stocks, the tech stocks today. France is electing a new president going for a conservative figurehead who's looking to topple President Macron. Back when Macron got elected, I used to make cute jokes like, oh, I love those Girl Scout cookies, the Macrons. Oh, no, those are macarons. Nah. Nothing like the proper pronunciation or own a good joke, right? Someone corrected my pronunciation of the word February on TV and sent an email. And I actually know the, the woman's daughter. And I know that the mom's an 80-year-old cranky lady who lives in Belmont. If you find yourself writing letters to TV stations or radio stations about someone's pronunciation, just turn the channel. That's just my opinion. No one cares. No one wants to hear from you. I grew up with English as a second language, and I think I do a pretty darn good job of hiding that. Um, Tesla is shrugging off a soft recall of 285,000 Model 3 vehicles and Model Y Tesla cars in China. The issue can be fixed with a software update, meaning owners won't even have to take their vehicles into the shop for repairs. It is one of the areas where Ford and GM scratch their proverbial beards and go, huh, why didn't we think of software updates? It's going to fix some alleged safety issues with the driver assistance systems. Due to the alleged flaw in Tesla systems, the SAMR, which is some sort of agency in China, the State Administration for Market Regulation, the SAMR, Anyway, Tesla's taking it in stride. But they've had a string of high-profile crashes, price changes, quality complaints, some recalls here and there. I think their automated driving is kind of bunk, having used it. Um, it's okay. It, it does cut down on accidents. It does give you proper distance and it does stay in the lane. It's a little unnatural at first. It's a little unnatural later. Is it the future? I don't know. Because even Elon Musk has said things like, oh, we'll never use LIDAR. LIDAR. And then suddenly he's using LIDAR. Oh, you know, radar's the way to go or imaging's the way to go. And like, yeah. What was promised for 2017, autonomous vehicles, or quickly in 2021 going, where are they? There are some actually. There's some operating right now in Las Vegas taking people to and from airports. But those are on preset, pre-recorded routes. Worthy of note. Medical debt is a uniquely American problem caused by a very broken and expensive healthcare system. Medical debt is the number one cause for bankruptcy in the United States. Millennials are living paycheck to paycheck more so than we want them to. 70% of millennials are not saving for emergencies like medical debt. 
if there's one thing I'm, I'm begging you, it's, it's try to get a six month reserve of cash. Try to get health insurance so that you don't hit medical debt. It, it, it's those setbacks in life that hurt the most on the road to creating wealth. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial money, investing and more. Find me online at robblackshow.com. The Rob Black Show is on social media, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Search The Rob Black Show.